Hello and welcome to the online class about female beauty in Spanish lands during 13th and 14th century. My name is Vita Rachovi. I am from Czech Republic, Central Europe. I belong to reenactment group Castilla 1312, attempting to recreate a Spanish diplomatic mission to European countries, calling for another Reconquista campaign against the Muslim Kingdom of Granada. The author of the paper I'm presenting here is my wife, Anne. In class, we are going to speak about what was considered beauty in medieval times Spain, ideals of beauty from Christian, Jewish, and Muslim community perspective, sources where to find information about cosmetic products, what materials were used, recipes for production of cosmetics, skin care, depilation, and antiperspirants. Please consider this work in progress as there are plenty of areas not covered yet. In medieval manuscripts, beauty often went hand in hand with health and hygiene. Books on medicine and surgery frequently contain chapters on charm, often accompanied by prescriptions for aphrodisiacs. Through herbs and drugs preparation, medicine was closely related to alchemy and books about magical properties of stones. Effects of plants, stones, animal parts, poisons, both curative and other, were considered magical and were frequently linked to astrology or witchcraft. We can find recipes for hair dyes, aphrodisiacal lecturies in magical books. Poetry book Libre de Buen Amor mentions witch herbalists and home preparation of cosmetics as well. Law called Siete Partidas makes local pharmacists responsible for the toxicity of curative, poisonous and other alchemical products crafted by them. Healthy visage had to be accompanied with pleasant scent as well. Medieval cookbooks include recipes for antiperspirants, mouth odors, sometimes even perfumes. Instructions for the production of perfumes and cosmetic procedures are mentioned in medical treatises of the 11th and 12th century AD by Ibn Wafid of Toledo and Ibn Zur, known as Ibn Zur. By 1000 AD, famous Cordoban physician, surgeon and chemist Al-Zarabi, also known as al bukasis dedicated a chapter in his work to perfume making, scented aromatics and incense. He also invented the perfume sticks, rolled and pressed in special molds, perhaps the earliest and descendants of the present-day lipsticks and solid deodorants. In 1320, André de Montlevy, famous French surgeon from Montpellier, town cited frequently in Cantigas de Santa Maria, writes in his treaty the surgery about cosmetic surgery, breast resizing, and women who sew breast bags on their tunics and tighten their breasts using lacing or bands. Unwritten knowledge of cosmetics was common to witch herbalists and midwives, as mentioned in a book of true love from the first third of the 14th century by Juan Ruiz, citing, Get one of those trollops who are skilled at making drugs, who act as midwives, patch up maids or charm a nurse's drugs, or mix up dyes and strange cosmetics out of totes and slugs, or blind young girls with evil eyes or cheat with autumn bugs. Around 1370 AD, Ibn al-Khatib, an Andalusian poet and historian, wrote the Book of Healthcare for Different Seasons, also known as the Book of Hygiene. There were always men who despised or damned cosmetics. In his sermons, St. Vincent of Ferreira, in the second half of 14th century, was zealous against women teaching their daughters to decorate and depilate themselves. Aragonian Bernard Metguin criticized the beautification of women in his book Dream. 
His concern is that when women start learning distillation at home, they subsequently flood the household with various cosmetics, tools and trinkets. In the first half of the 15th century, the Valencian author Manuel Diaz de Calatayud, the Chamberlain of King Alfonso the Great, created an extensive collection of cosmetics and medicines, book Flores del Tesoro de la Belleza, Flowers of the Treasure of Beauty. It is a summary of folk medicine from ancient times and art medicine. The book provides instructions for home preparation of medicinal and beauty products. The book Lepidario by King Alfonso X from 1276 deals, among other things, with the cosmetic use of various stones. The effects of minerals are attributed to astrology and stars. Hundreds of stones or stone-like substances of animal origin are catalogued according to their properties and associated with zodiac sign. Properties relevant to this class include cosmetics, skin care, makeup, tooth and gum powders, hair dyes, bleaches and curling, dep depilation, weight loss. The Hebrew book Sefer Ahabad Nashim, the book of female love, dates from the second half of the 13th century and is of French or Catalan origin. This book comprehensively deals with the female body, beauty, gynecological problems, sexuality and love magic. Christian, Jewish and Muslim communities had slightly different views on the ideal of female beauty. A very extensive and hard to be description of what a Christian beauty is supposed to fulfill was written by Juan Ruiz, author of the Book of True Love, Libro de Buen Amor, in the 1330s, citing, Seek out a woman sensuous and beautiful and gay, whose needs are dwarfish, stumpy, short, or built the other way, and if you can, avoid a wench of boorish peasant clay, because love subtleties are lost on women such as they. Be sure she's medium-figured, then, and a rather small of head, with hair of gleaming, yellow gold, not fiery henna red, with arched and parted eyebrows, like a long and narrow thread, and wide across the cantles, that's the kind to bless a bed. Her eyes should glow like tinted jewels, lustrous in their hue, with long outcurving lashes, clean as grasses washed in dew. Her ears should be like little shells, close set and not askew, and if her neck is graceful, she's a woman for the few. Her nostrils must be delicate, her teeth be small and white, well spaced and even, spotless, clean, and each with each unite. The lips that close her little mouth of scarlet must excite the stormy tender kiss of love, for that is love's delight. Her little mouth should ever curve with love's voluptuous line. Her skin should not be hairy, but so soft and white and fine. You'll lust to have her when you see her naked and supine, for well I know her form will show her a morous design. Suppose this ball describes your lady a posterior and mention graceful members in her detailed inventory. Do ask her if her breasts are small and if they are, why glory? To hear the rest, such revelations make a gripping story. If she affirms her armpits sweat a lusty, wholesome smell and says her legs are slender, while her ties and hips outswell, with supple waist and saddle wide, with insteps high as well. Believe me, such a perfect woman has no parallel. Then, if she's passionate in bed, but modest while she's out, don't miss the chance that God may send to try a little bout. Take care your lady has no whiskers on her lip or chin. To hell with such, for death is one unpardonable sin.
But if your dame is small of hand and delicately thin, inflame her passions all you can, then gallantly begin. That was Juan Ruiz, translated by Alicia Kent Kane in 1933. Let's reiterate quickly. Blonde hair, long lashes, parted and shaped eyebrows, thin red lips, small white teeth, small breasts, soft white skin, no body hair, no beard, minimal perspiration, slender legs, small hand, delicately thin. Let's take a look at Christian beauties depicted in 13th century books. The first image from left, titled A Girl in Love, comes from Libro de Astromagia by Alfonso X. The second two images are from Libro de los Juegos by Alfonso X as well. You can see blonde hair, shaped and parted eyebrows, soft white skin, thin red lips, small hands, slender statue. I've got pretty good match. Another picture from Libro de los Juegos. We can see even red cheeks here. The last picture comes from Libro de los Juegos again, showing noble ladies. A high cylindrical hat was reserved for women coming from the highest social ranks. Graceful neck, little scarlet mouth, long blonde hair, also wavy hair. Juan Ruiz did perfect job. Muslim beauties were in many ways similar to Christian ones. In the Spanish translation of Stories of a Thousand and One Night from the 13th century, the story of the young girl Theodore presents 18 aspects of female beauty which are arranged in six groups of three. The beauty should have a long torso, long neck and long toes, small mouth, nose and feet, wide hips, shoulders and forehead. She must also have white skin, teeth and whites of the eyes, black hair, eyebrows and pupils and red cheeks, lips and gums. The 13th century love story of Bayad and Rayad, Hadith Bayad by Riyad, mentions that the girl had breasts like two apples on a marble tray. Also in the works of the other authors, the emphasis is placed on female curves, fair skin, dark but shiny hair, a sparkling look, red cheeks and mouths, and healthy breathing. Blonde hair is rarely admitted. Also in the works of other authors, the emphasis is placed on female curves, fair skin, dark but shiny hair, a sparkling look, red cheeks and mouths, and healthy breathing. Blonde hair is rarely admired. For example, blonde hair is mentioned by the Andalusian scholar Ibn Hazm for the 11th century. The 12th century Granada poet Hafsa bin al Hajj al-Rukuniya writes about the beauty of wavy hair. The Persian author Al-Hamadani from 14th century describes what a woman should definitely not look like. Her mouth is not fresh, her breasts are withered, her belly is barren, her eyes are sad and her saliva is cloudy. The illumination accompanying the slide is Christian depiction of Muslim women in their house attire from Libro de los Juegos. Finally, woven transparent silks were famously produced in Valencia, and we can see men and women of all faiths clad in scarves, kufayas, or even larger transparent garments, sometimes overdress, sometimes like here, as a house dress. Makes a perfect sense for fiery hot summer in southern Spain. This is Muslim depiction of Muslim beauties from the story of Bayad Barayat. In general, Muslims were forbidden to depict people, but restrictions in Spain were not so tight all the time.
Another picture of African Moors shows us what seems to be a lipstick on both men and women. Andalusian elites were known to keep both male and female harems. Harem musicians were professionals, trained from early childhood and sold for large sums. Jewish women usually adapted greatly in appearance and clothing to the society in which they lived, whether Christian or Muslim. The Jewish authors extolled the beauty of women and emphasized black hair, white skin and red cheeks, teeth like pearls. There are also Hebrew texts in which blonde hair is desirable. Jewish texts, as well as in Arabic and Christian texts, put the emphasis on fair skin. The 12th century Toledo poet Jacob and Elazar, in his work Sefer HaMeshalim, adheres to the description of beautiful women of the same ideal of beauty as Christian authors. The illumination with cool musicians on the right side comes from Golden Haggadah, Barcelona 1320. With this image of Jewish beauty depicted in a Ryland's Haggadah at Passover table from Catalonia, 1350, we're closing the chapter on ideals of beauty. The next part focuses on cosmetics. Various raw materials of plant, animal and mineral origin were used for the production of cosmetics. Some materials were common and accessible to everybody. Some were exotic and appropriately expensive ingredients from imports. Starting with plants, some plants were usable almost whole. For example, the leaf tree was prized for its leaves, whole fruits, pressed oil and the seeds themselves. On the other hand, only specific parts of other plants were used. For example, the Rosella lichen root, which grows on rocks washed with seawater, was used as a powder ingredient. Aloe root is mentioned as an aromatic herb by Ibn Battuta. The leaves of laurel, henna or myrtle have been widely used. Both bark and ash from burned roots were used from willow and elm trees. Juices from fruits and vegetables are mentioned as well, for example, apples, figs, leeks, or cabbage. Flowers were an important raw material for the production of perfumes. Roses had a privileged place among them. The cultivation of roses was legally regulated in the municipal laws called fueros of towns Cuenza, Teruel, Sepulveda, Brihuega and other cities. Other popular flowers were carnation, orange blossom or lavender. Various grains, respectively ground flour, dried beans and their infusion also had cosmetic use. The expensive raw materials were rare spices, such as cloths, nutmeg, and ginger. Various resins, like frankincense, camphora, myrrh, and also opium. In addition to olive oil, cosmetics manufacturers also valued better almond oil and various essential oils. Sandalwood, for example, was important from Jerusalem to produce essential oils. There was a wide range of raw materials of animal origin, from the most common to luxury goods from all over the known world at the time. For example, expensive musk was imported to Spain from Central Asia, China and Tibet. Amber and pearls were expensive ingredients too. White and red coral or cuttlefish were obtained from the sea. The meat and egg and the cuttlefish bone was utilized from the cuttlefish. Other frequently used raw materials were hence eggs, 
egg whites, egg yolks, and shells. Swallow eggs and crow's eggs were used to, which, according to Bernard Medquin, was able to color the hair black. Pork or dog lard and mutton tallow were used for the production of ointments, and sheep bile acted as an emulsifier. To make women to make women beautiful, they were willing to apply raw materials such as ant eggs and red ashes, which were added to depilatory products or even animal feces to promote hair growth. A number of minerals were also used for cosmetic purposes. The lapidary of Alfonso X mentions that the minerals acquired many good properties from the stars, which can be used for healing and beautification. Sometimes these minerals are only ground to a dust and used separately. Other times they are mixed with plant and animal ingredients. For example, to achieve beautiful skin, the following procedures are given. The fifth degree of the Gemini sign is a stone called Margul from Chaldei, probably Goethite. His nature is hot and humid. It is mined in a moon mountain where the Nile is born. The stone is strong, heavy and hard to break. It shines a little, but it is not transparent. It has the color of yolk. When they break the stone, it is damp inside and the moisture sticks to the hands and it smells very good. And if you apply it to ulcers or a cloth that you put on your face, after removing the skin is smooth and bright. Other stones that Lapidary says are used to cleanse the skin are so-called Arabic stone, which is ivory in color, soft to touch but hard, probably Mont Moriah in it, or a Muriquit stone from a place called Kareen, which is probably quartzite. Ona stone, probably gypsum, and marble is recommended for whitening and lightening the skin. Ground glass filtered through fine cloth is used in makeups for screen brightening. Because medieval beauties had to have soft, fair and spotless skin, they did not rely solely on minerals. Ibn Battuta mentions coconuts from India, which gives the body strength, gain well after consuming them, and brighten the color of the face. Lard and various ointments were also used to beautify the skin of the face and neck, to which perfumes, musk and amber were added for a better scent. The Book of Female Love presents several recipes for beautiful skin without warts, among them myrrh oil, called the oil of kings. Women kept the skin of their hands soft with a mixture of lemon juice and sugar. Lemon juice with sugar is still used as a peeling today. The image on the right displays glass perfume sprinkler from Egypt or Syria. When carrying cosmetics wasn't enough, it was complemented by decorative one. Manuel Diaz de Calatiut has written a recipe for a powder in his collection of cosmetics and medicines, Flowers of the Treasure of Beauty. The powder will cause the face look beautiful, pale and fresh for a long time and will not cause wrinkles or cracked skin. Take half a pound of white wet and two ounces of white oatmeal and lars flour and a pound of white sicarian, we couldn't identify this one, and a little camphor and half an ounce of dried rosella lichen root and half an ounce of pearls, good burned glass and white coral and a quarter of an ounce of powdered glass and an ounce of marble and the same amount of pure calcined gypsum. Crush it all to powder and sift through a fine line and sieve and apply it to the face. In addition, apply some balm to your face. It will stay forever young, beautifully colored, and does not grow old or wrinkle. 
Book of Cooking in Maghreb and Andalus in the year of Almohads, also known as Andalusian cookbook from 13th century, provides us a recipe for mouth odor, a lecture using musk. Take a myth qual of musk, half an ikea of aloe sticks, called moonwood, and half an ikea each of Chinese laurel and Indian lavender. Pound the medicinal herbs and add them to two rattles of sugar dissolved in rose water and cook it into an electuary. The resulting potion lightens the spirit and improves the smell of the breath. There are also recipes for mouthwashes based on wine or vinegar and scented with rosemary, marjoram, cinnamon, mint or pepper. The topic that is especially important in the warm regions and summer months is depilation and antiperspirants. Juan Ruiz considers hairy women an unpardonable sin. He was not alone in believing that women should not be overgrown. Bernard Metquin, in his book The Dream, mentions that some women tore their eyebrows and forehead and shaved their faces and necks with sharp glass. In the Muslim world, depilation of all body hair was common. Hadiths, describing the life and deeds of Muhammad, contained explicit references to shaving armpit and pubic hair, both women and men. In addition to hygiene, the emphasis is put on the greater aesthetics of the shaved body. Cantigas de Santa Maria by Alfonso X contains many descriptions of naked bodies without any body hair. Lime or rosin, a mixture of ash and lime cooked in oil, arsenic sulfides and other substances were usually used to permanently remove hair. The Hebrew book of female love from the second half of the 13th century states the following recipe. Take bad blood, cinnamon powder, and eggs and poppies. Mix this and paint where necessary. It's tried and tested. It is difficult to say whether bad blood has the desired effects, but end egg oil is still sold as a natural means of preventing hair growth. Poppy oil is said to have a beneficial effect on the skin. Recipes for the permanent chemical depilation have often emphasized that women should monitor how long they allow these compounds to work. An appropriate number of prayers had to be recited to determine the exact duration of action. If it happened that skin irritation still occurred, fennel or lily oil or a decoction of violets and bran or willow and hibiscus was recommended for soothing. The decoction should be used in the morning if possible. One of the authors experimented with ant eggs oil and it was really working, though she missed the right duration and got irritated for several years. However, the tested spot on the leg didn't grow any hair for these years too. Diaz de Calatayud brings a recipe called What of Pleasure in the book Flores del Tesoro de Abeza. This potion is prepared by taking small drowned rats, which are burned to a fine dust and boiled in water. This water then removes the hair it makes contact with. In addition to hair removal recipes, there were ones that were supposed to ensure that once torn or shaved, the hair would not grow again. For example, a stone called a zarnik in the lapidary of Alfonso X, also called or piment in Latin, which is or pigment, poisonous or zonic sulfide, was popular at the time. The municipal legislation mentions the fees associated with the extraction and sale of this mineral. In the flower of female beauty, a mixture of ivy leaf juice mixed with crushed aura pigment, vinegar, and ant eggs is recommended. When applied to shaved areas, hair will not grow there again. However, the procedure must be repeated for eight or nine days. Aura pigment mixed with slaked lime is still commonly used for depilation 
in India. Removing armpit hair was not just a matter of aesthetics, but also a way to reduce sweat odor. According to Juan Ruiz, the right woman should have armpit just only a bit damp. The book Lapidario describes several stones that act as antiperspirants. Alum was very effective in the fight against sweat. Alum from Egypt and Macedonia was considered to be the best. From the local Spanish production, the most famous alum was from Castile, probably from Mazaron. Alum was not used in its raw form. According to the instructions in the lapidary, it was necessary to first burn it, then mix it with something, probably various aromatic components, and rub it under the armpit. After burning and crushing, the limestone was to be mixed with vinegar and painted on sweating areas. The description of the stone term Mises, possibly melanchorite, poisonous green rock, states Turbid thick and green water is drawn from a very deep well and left to dry to stone within one day. Half drachma of a stone, term is his wave, and more, dries the whole body, shrinks nerves, and kills. If you mix it with wine and rub the body, you will lose wave so that it looks great, but if you continue, you will welcome death. The stone has such a property that the one who carries it never sweats, and the humidity in it never increases. For comparison, we're adding instructions for the production of antiperspirant from Syria. This recipe is part of the 13th century Syrian cookbook, a book on building friendships through taste and smell, published in English under the title Scents and Flavors, a Syrian cookbook. Soak moss in a rose water for one day. Squeeze dry and chop to pieces. Put the moss, zinc oxide and violets in water and add squeezed rose water. If needed, add more rose water. Grind until all the water is absorbed. Add more rose water and repeat five times. Let it dry in a glass jar so it would stick to a porcelain bowl. Sink. Leave the dish 10 times in agar wood smoke and then 10 times in amber smoke. Net it between every two fumes, stick to bowl and drizzle with rose water. When sufficiently permeated with smoke, spread it to fine dust and use. This powder prevents odor from the armpits and refreshes the breath. It's the best recipe. Durham has about three grams. So with that, we're closing uh, our today's class about female beauty and cosmetics. Next slides are listing the sources. We're using both contemporary and modern sources. We've drawn heavily from uh, Nieves Gonzalez. I would like to give a big thank you to everybody who helped us. Donna Green Tai, Kathani, Nieves Rico Parreño, Dara Cornell, Pavel Alexeychuk, Meridian, and others. Thank you for your attention.